Good evening. We are very happy to welcome you to another session of our Jornadas de Feminismos. And we are very happy to have Professor Carol White with us, um, both because of the relevance of her particular work, but also because we believe that in a world which seems so overwhelming, can help us shed light where other humanities and social sciences seem to be helpless. And we think that having theology in a university like ours, um, it's a, a good way of start thinking in different manners about our surroundings, our environment. Um, Professor Carol White is Presidential Professor of Philosophy of Religion at Bucknell University, specializing in post-structural philosophies, processes of philosophy and theism, religious naturalism, science and religion, and critical theory and religion. Her books include Post-Structuralism, Feminism and Religion, Triangulating Positions, The Legacy of Anne Conway, Reverberations from a Mystical Naturalism, and Black Lives and Sacred Humanity Toward an African-American Religious Naturalism, which won a choice award for outstanding academic titles. Professor White has published numerous essays in philosophy of religion and on religious naturalism. Her work in philosophy and critical religious thought has also appeared in Saigon, the Journal of Religion and Science, the American Journal of Theology and Philosophy, Philosophia Africana, and Religion and Public Life. She has received international awards and national fellowships, including an Oxford University Fellowship in Religion and Science, a Science and Religious Grant from the John Templeton Foundation, and the NEH Fellowship. She's currently finishing a book manuscript exploring a trajectory of modernist racial discourse that intimately could join white supremacy and speciesism in promoting views of black animality and doing research for a new book project that explores the tenets of deep ecology and insights of religious naturalism expressed in contemporary North American nature poets and writers. So you're very welcome and I will let you share your ideas with us and we will be listening closely. Thank you so much, Mariana. And um, I'm so delighted to be with you all. I especially want to thank Anna, Laura for this gracious invitation. And I want to thank all of those behind the scenes who are making this um, presentation possible. And all of those that I cannot see, um, welcome. So the title of my presentation is Emerging Feminist Visions Within Religious Naturalism, Aesthetic, Ethical, Ecological Possibilities. Within the last several decades, a variety of frameworks, theoretical frameworks, intent on rethinking reality and assessing the materiality of life have emerged often coined the new materialism by some, these perspectives include recent developments in feminine, feminist theories, animal studies, post-humanism, and vegetal studies. With varying points of departure and emphases, they have collectively challenged static ontologies that have upheld impoverished binary views of alterity, white, non-white, divine, human, male, female, human, non-human, able-bodied, disabled, normal, queer. In this presentation, I introduced religious naturalism as an emerging capacious materialist discourse aligned with the general aims of these trends. And I then explore the feminist visions that might emerge from it, particularly with the tenets of religious naturalism, I theorize the category of the human as embedded 
in myriad nature, advancing the concepts of materiality and relationality um, as correctives to binary thinking in Western philosophical and humanistic thought. I also focus on three themes that reveal the aesthetic, ethical, and ecological orientation of the feminist vision I introduce. Number one, the embodied relational self. Number two, humans' inextricable connection to the more than human worlds. And number three, an expanded notion of agency. I conclude with some brief comments um, that can, um, I conclude with some brief comments on how these feminist possibilities can function in the Anthropocene, a transitional time in which the older order stains, strains and fractures. Key to my discussion is a working definition of feminism, briefly described as a rubric encompassing transformative intellectual discourses and social, cultural, political activities invested in creating conditions whereby all life flourishes. Feminism also recognizes the importance of reflecting from the lived experiences of women, one identifiable life form as a particular point of departure for grasping the various forms of injustice and violence experienced by myriad nature and achieving its overall goals and objectives. So this is my work and definition. Um, and I would love to, um, hear some of your comments about it in the Q&A. So part one, what is religious naturalism, you might ask? Religious naturalism is still emerging <clears throat> um, as a theoretical discourse within the academy. Even though many of its tenets have been shaped by select thinkers and movements in past eras. I identify religious naturalism with a synthesis of naturalistic ideas that depart from traditional forms of religiosity. At the heart of this ecologically based worldview in all of its variants is a basic conviction. Any truths we are ever going to discover and any meaning in life we should uncover are revealed to us through the natural order. Thus the qualifier religious in religious naturalism affirms the natural world as the center of humans' most significant experiences and understandings. There is no ontologically distinct and superior realm to ground, explain, or give meaning to this world. Rather, as Wesley Wildman asserts, for religious naturalists, there is the ceaseless ex explicit focus on myriad nature in its beauty, terror, scale, emergent complexity and evolutionary development. Another crucial idea in religious naturalism is that of emergence. According to cell biologist Ursula Goodenough, a prominent representative of religious naturalism, emergent properties arise as a consequence of relationships. For example, the relationships between water molecules that generate a snowflake or the relationships between neurons that generate a memory. Emergent properties also give rise to yet more emergent properties, generating a vast complexity of our present day cosmic, biological, ecological, and cultural contexts. Religious naturalism thus encourages humans to reflect meaningfully on the emergence of matter and especially life from the Big Bang forward, promoting an understanding of myriad nature as complex processes of becoming. For my purposes in this presentation, I want to highlight religious naturalism's theoretical appeal in its fundamental conception of humans as natural processes 
intrinsically connected to other natural processes. The advances of the sciences through both physics and biology have served to demonstrate not only how closely linked human animals are with nature, but that we are simply one branch of a seemingly endless natural cosmos. Donald Crosby, another na religious naturalist, puts it in more eloquent terms. Nature requires no explanation beyond itself. It always has existed and always will exist in some shape or form. Its constituents, principal laws, and relations are the sole reality. This reality takes on new traits and possibilities as it evolves inexorably through time. Human beings are integral parts of nature and they are natural beings through and through. They, like all living beings, are outcomes of biological evolution. So understanding the deep history of the cosmos is profoundly important for any basic understanding of the materiality of being human, of being alive in the manner we currently find ourselves. Big Bang cosmology, for example, based on the interconnection and interaction of all its fundamental components. Bearing in mind these insights, I share Loyal Rue's notion that humans are ultimately the manifestations of many interlocking systems, atomic, molecular, biochemical, anatomical, and ecological, apart from which human existence is incomprehensible. As byproducts of other natural processes and intimate participants with them, humans are material beings through and through. Consider, for example, Michael J. Fox's compelling account that our bodies contain the mineral elements or primordial rocks. Our very cells share the same historically evolved components as those of grasses and trees. Our brains contain the basic neural core of reptile, bird, and fellow mammal. So these particular citations are reinforcing the idea that we are material beings and we're also relational beings. We are also structured by relationality. In the sacred depths of nature, Good Enough offers a very lucid account of humans as relational natural organisms, provi providing sound scientific data that supports our fundamental interconnectedness with other living beings. As she puts it, we have through the ages sought connection with higher powers in the sky or beneath the earth or with ancestors in some other realm. We have also sought and found religious fellowship with one another. And now we realize that we are connected to all creatures, not just in food chains or ecological equilibria. We share a common ancestor. We share genes for receptors and cell cycles and signal transduction cascades. We share evolutionary constraints and possibilities. In short, my friends, we are connected all the way down. Good enough's observations support my view that humans are by our very constitution, relational beings and our wholeness occurs within a matrix of complex interconnectedness in ways of conjoining with others that transform us. In light of these observations, the scientific epic becomes the starting point for developing a view of the human constituted by a central tenet. Humans are relational processes of nature. In this context, I contend that our humanity is not a given, but rather an achievement. Consider that from a strictly biological perspective, humans are mere organisms that have slowly evolved by a process of natural selection from earlier primates. From one generation to another, the species that is now alive has gradually adapted to changing environments, 
so that it could continue to survive. Our animality from this perspective is living under the influence of genes, instincts, and emotions with a prime directive to survive. Yet this minimalist approach fails to consider what some cognitive scientists and many humanists, philosophers, and religionists tend to accentuate, and that is our own personal experience of what it is like to be an experiencing human being. As I've discussed in my published work, becoming human or actualizing ourselves as human beings, in this sense, emerges out of, emerges out of an awareness and desire to be more than a conglomeration of pulsating cells. It is suggesting that our humanity is not reducible to organizational patterns or processes dominated by brain structures, nor do DNA, diet, behavior, and the environment solely structure it. Human animals become human destinies when we posit fundamental questions of value, meaning, and purpose to our existence. Our coming to be human destinies is structured by a crucial question. How do we come to terms with life? Excuse me for a moment. This particular question, um, oh, hold on. Forgive me for a moment. So now I'm going to go to the second part of my presentation, aesthetic, ethical, feminist possibilities. Given the theoretical notions that I've highlighted in religious naturalism, and my fundamental question about how do we come to terms with life, I want to posit that this fundamental question is one that has structured important historical feminist articulations and active activism through the years. While too numerous to name here, the various ways feminism has conceptualized women's embodiment and demanded that they be treated as intrinsically valuable life forms reflect various, re reflect religious naturalism's relational ontology. In conjunction with values discourse, the emergent feminist orientation I introduced here extends this theme. It upholds humans embodied awareness and appreciation of our connection to all that is as an expression of what is ultimately important and valuable. In other words, relational nature. So aesthetically, this insight suggests that humans are interconnected parts of nature and our sense of becoming human is in recognizing we are an essential part of nature's rich, spectacular complexity and beauty. In this context, feminist insights function as, a, as correctives to the impoverished, ill-conceived accounts of our shared humanity reflected in models of binary thinking that have demarcated certain spheres, <clears throat> certain spheres of life as superior and others as inferior, justifying the exploitative practices of the former. Here, Carolyn Merchant's very early and helpful study in the death of nature is helpful to retrieve. In this study, Merchant draws important parallels between early modern Europeans views of nature and cultural perceptions of various groups, women, indigenous peoples, and folk in the Americas, Asia, and Africa. Merchant focuses primarily on the gender implications of this binary differentiation examining its role in justifying a hierarchical order of nature where women were situated below men and their physiological functions of reproduction, nurture, 
and child rearing were closer, were viewed closer to nature and less important in the functioning of culture. As she argues, at the root of the identification of women and animality with a lower form of human life lies the distinction between nature and culture fundamental to humanistic disciplines such as history, literature, and anthropology, which accept that distinction as an unquestioned assumption. So Merchant is writing this back in 1983 and her work has uh, received a lot of attention to some extent. It's one of the earliest formulations of how uh, this nature culture binary has functioned um, within the modern world. With this conception of the material relational human, this feminist vision that I am introducing here resists the lure of a generic universal construction of man that has justified the devalued status of fleshy material women and other embodied subjects relegated to minority status. It rejects the enlightenment configurations of this normative human that has been configurations that have been associated with a coherent white property and rational subjectivity. I'm sure you all are probably familiar with this, but it's never, uh, we can never um, cease to be reminded of this because this binary um, differentiation still exists today in so many different ways. The residual effects of it are still with us. This vision reminds us that Variations of this ideology of dualism were integral proponents of Western European cultural imperialism and expansion, where the purported civilized races of Europe identified and distinguished their own normative humanity over against other groups they encountered in the Americas, Asia, and Africa as an extension of the nature culture dichotomy that Merchant has highlighted, racialized notions of differentiation help to justify the West colonization and exploitation of various cultures. It's a narrative, as I said, that keeps being perpetuated in many different forms, even to the present day. Rather than assume then that gender, race, class, able bodiness and other socially derived markers provide the basis of our humanity, the feminist vision that I'm introducing invites us to recognize all of these markers as highly complex categories constructed in contested discourses and other social practices. When these constructions and their derivative, when these derived constructions are used to support racism, speciesism, sexism, nationalism, anti-LGBTQ plus practices, and other forms of cultural superiority, they become forced impositions on the wholeness of natural interrelatedness and deep genetic homology that evolution has wrought. As Mary Jane, sorry, I didn't catch that. Sorry. As Mary Jane Rubenstein astutely observes, attending to this influential binary structure that Merchant highlighted in her early work means attending to the formulation of his racially, ethically, environmentally, sexually, and theological toxic companions. Even as I speak today, and especially during this week of International Women's Week, feminist voices continue to draw our attention to the violations against myriad nature. And one biotic form of that is women. Situating these feminist voices help us to see the vulnerabilities that women lives experience due to mis misogynist violence. We also want to stay focused on the global struggles for women workers in the workplace, in society, and at home. Gender-based violence remains a systemic challenge around the world. 
rooted in patriarchy and enforced through institutional and cultural practices. Addressing these forms of violation against the deep genetic homology wrought by evolution helps us comprehend and champion the value of all materiality. So I come to the second part of my presentation, this conception of the embodied relational self and our relationship to the more than human worlds. So the first part, especially around gender violence and racism and xenophobia and all of those, those are the ways in which this binary differentiation has created false separation among and within humans. The second part, I'm going to highlight how this binary differentiation has given some humans the illusion that we are separate from the more than human worlds of which we are constituted. So one important critique accompanying this conception of the embodied relational self is the tendency of modern humanistic discourses to overestimate the autonomy of human animals or human beings and to position us outside of complex myriad nature, rendering impossible or invisible, rendering invisible our inextricable connection to other life forms and material processes. In this respect, this relational material view of the human envisions new ways of combating human exceptionalism, recognizing our embeddedness in materiality and honoring the rich diversity of life in which we humans are constituted. Donna Haraway's um, work into this problem are helpful. In her published work, she has tried to unmask the persistent forms of anthropocentrism lurking in many of our feminist, ethical, and philosophical articulations. In Cyborg Manifesto, Haraway breaks with older notions of humanism as she reinvents the category of the human, expressed wonderfully in this citation. The last speech hits of uniqueness have been polluted if not turned to an amusement box. Language, tool use, social behavior, mental events, nothing really convincingly settles the separation of human and animal. And many people no longer feel the need for such a separation. Indeed, many branches of feminist culture affirm the pleasure of connection of human and other living creatures. Movements for animal rights are not irrational denials of human uniqueness. They are a clear sighted recognition of connection across the discredited reach of nature and culture. Biology and evolutionary theory over the last two centuries have simultaneously produced modern organisms as objects of knowledge and reduced the line between humans and animals to a faint trace, re etch an ideological struggle for professional disputes between life and social science. So the feminist narrative that I continue to outline here underscores Haraway's insights. While acknowledging humans as a particular configuration of becoming within the larger biotic community, this feminist vision also asserts that humans are deeply interrelated with and reliant on other beings, viruses, bacteria, other animals. Accordingly, one interesting spin on Karen decolonizing of efforts is confronting the dominant cultural fantasy of human exceptionalism, which anchors humans on one side of the great divide away from all species. This premise assumes that the human alone is not a spatial and temporal web of interspecies dependencies. Countering this phantasm, which has lent theoretical support to popular myths of the self-made individual in various cultural and intellectual contexts, context, Haraway again describes humanity's 
this intricate entanglement with other material processes. And this is one of my favorite citations from Haraway. I love the fact that human genomes can be found in only about 10% of all the cells that are, occupy the mundane space I call my body. The other 90% of the cells are filled with the genomes of bacteria, fungi, proteins, and such, some of which play in a symphony necessary to my being alive at all, and some of which are hitching a ride and doing the rest of me, of us, no harm. I am vastly outnumbered by my tiny companions. Better put, I become an adult being, human being, in company with these tiny messmates. To be one is always to become with many. I'll repeat that. To be one is always to become with many. Haraway's point underscores the feminist conviction that all human endeavors arise from the critical awareness that we are part of an inextricable network of natural processes that make the very category of the human itself intelligible. Our embeddedness within myriad nature invigorates a fuller sense of our expansive humanity as already always entangled becoming. Our humanity is already always entangled becoming. This emphasis on the composite self also has monumental implications for addressing the gender-based health care inequities in our various societies. So part three, I want to highlight this idea of human agency within this feminist vision of the relational material self. As humans experience existence, the meaningfulness of that existence is mediated through values discourse. In other words, humans do more than just exist. We actualize ourselves or engage in processes of becoming through subjectivizing the world around us using particular principles, standards, or ideals that both inform as well as guide that actualization. Among the various value systems are ethical ones concerned with basic questions of how humans ought to live, for what we ought to hope, and to what we aspire in our actions. Insofar as feminists have vigilantly affirmed women's full humanity amid the historical evolution of what is now a global movement. Feminism's emancipatory aims have persisted in associating women as agents with a fundamental propensity towards life. I like to repeat that. Insofar as feminist has affirmed women's full humanity, its emancipatory aims have persisted in associating women as agents with a fundamental propensity towards life. I like to emphasize there is no escape from the radical relationality and the irrefutable materiality that structure of human existence. This women therefore see humans effectively and compassionately enacting our constitutive relationality in particular ways in our current era, the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene concept describes a range of events that are part of life in the 21st century. And you see the Anthropos in the Anthropocene term. This is a view of the human that has wreaked havoc on um, the planet. And it comes out of a interesting notion that humans are separate from nature. So I'm highlighting this particular concept because we um, are being um, addressed with the effects of anthropogenic climate change or the effects of humans interaction with the worlds around us. 
current rates of carbon release into the atmosphere are unprecedented over the past 66 million years. The rapid rise of sea levels continues and it's likely to displace millions of people. And among those displaced are always the most vulnerable ones, women and children and poor and people of color. Other crises also loom ranging from forced migration, mass species extinction, water scarcity and ocean acidification. So as noted by scientists and ecologists, these are not isolated arbitrary events, but rather a set of interrelated problems generated by the effects of human activity on the Earth's system. As a global geophysical force on the planet system, the way we have enacted our humanity up until this point has unleashed planetary forces beyond our control, directing the continual viability of many species, including our own. And I'd like to add here that uh, we all don't share equally <laughs> in this form of um, anthropogenic um, activity. Um, we all know that, that there are some who are more culpable than others. I don't have to name them, but we, we want to recognize that. Uh, so these alarming factors have helped to produce Anthropocene narratives that it invoke the concept of human agency in attempts to legitimate decisions and motivate actions in response to the problem of anthropogenic climate change. When set within the context of moral theory, these narratives also raise thorny questions about the challenging past of moving from the descriptive to the normative. In other words, when asking about humans' purpose, purposeful activity in response to the Anthropocene, these narratives draw attention to the perennial conundrum of how to get from the is to the art. As ethicist Maria Antonaccio has stated more eloquently, evoking the classic is-art distinction within moral theory Various thinkers contend that as a description of our current planetary condition, the Anthropocene concept by itself um, cannot support any conclusion for how we are to behave. In the limited time I have left, however, I um, want to try to offer a tentative response, even though I cannot flesh it out fully. What I want to suggest then is that this question of how we are to proceed in the Anthropocene um, is by highlighting this notion of the material relational human and to suggest that the very category of the human is embedded in nature itself. So this feminist vision offers potential inroads for us to consider. In other words, it provides a plausible rationale that we can use in our ethical concerns, going back to my question here of what art, oops, sorry, what art we to do? To articulate this contention better, I first appeal to the religious naturalist concept of ecological perspectivism, which contends that the world we inhabit has a plurality of perspectives a plurality of entities, each with its own individuality and particularity of expression. Accordingly, everything that exists in the world has distinctive perspective on everything else. Again, Crosby is helpful. All the elemental particles, atoms, molecules, compounds, inorganic and organic entities and combination of those entities including human beings and their histories, cultures, and societies, and all of the actions, reactions, functions, qualities, and traits of those particular things and their relations are included. No two perspectives or systems of them are exactly alike. A variation of this theme has been articulated on another level by Donna Haraway with her concept of situate, situated knowledges. According to Haraway, 
Situated knowledge is knowledge that is placed within a context. As contextualized knowledge, it is a limited point of view. At the same time, Haraway argues that these situated points of views are richer because they take into account the numerous bits of information constituting the milieu of that point of view. Moreover, each particular situated knowledge exemplifies how each limited point of view is enriched and becomes more comprehensive through the exchange of knowledge. So this is again about the entangled way that we are with each other and how we are enriched when we listen to each other and recognize that every perspective is important. When set within an ecological perspective, Haraway's views reinforce the fact that human perspectives are included with and inflected by the perspective of other existence in the universe. For example, Philip Phil Clayton's discussion of human valuing as part of the vital sphere of activity throughout the biosphere is helpful. He says the biosphere, the biosphere was packed with living interpreted systems well before human beings came onto the scene, onto the stage. And he also highlights the fact that these agents were already possess many of the perspectives that are manifested in higher organism. Every organism, every living thing is an agent composed communities of living parts. They sense or perceive their environment, they process data and make appropriate responses. The living the life world is agent-centered. This is a Gentile universe. We live within an appreciable universe. We are part of a vibrant, evolving universe. So I'm going to suggest then, humans are not at the center of this vibrant universe. We highlight functional differences, but that does not mean that we have ontological superiority. What we want to assume, however, is that the rich feminist notion that we are entangled materiality and this entangled materiality gives us an insight into why we have to ask the question of how we ought to respond or why we should respond. We are actually constituted to ask that question because of the fact that we are always entangled and related to everything else that is. So this is important to think about. The ethical import in asking why or how we are to be, how to respond is basically an act in our constitutive relationality. In the final analysis, we cannot ask, we cannot escape asking the question, of what we ought to do. This point dovetails nicely with a feminist notion of entangled materiality suggested by Karen Barad's creative notion of intraactive becomings. And as another uh, friend of mine, Catherine Keller would say, humans are always already responsible to the others with whom or which we are entangled not through conscious intent, but through the various ontological entanglements that materiality entails. So I'm now going to slowly come towards my closing here. With its metaphysical perspectivism and communal ontology, the feminist vision I outlined has the potential to cont contribute to a politics of myriad nature. And within this particular point, the idea is that justice can never be realized in the abstract, but must be lived. We must live out our constitutional um, relationality. In addressing, therefore, ecological de degradation on various levels, this feminist orientation reminds humans that with our particular realms, of activity and our capacities of influence, 
We have responsibility to act in ways that promote the flourishing of all life and to urge other humans who may be less aware of, of our interconnectedness to do the same. As Marie Hauser observes, the boomerang of anthropogenic climate change, which rounds back to humans bringing its pain, withers the phantasm of the sovereign human species. Climate change exposes the ways in which the human and the more than human exist in lateral, not hierarchical relation. To some, the slip of the human from his vaunted station constitutes a final dizzying insult to the traditional order. Already the thinking goes, too much challenged by social justice movements. In short, the human is always already part of myriad nature. If such is the case, Community with other natural processes does not happen to us as a result of our efforts. We don't create it. Rather, community is that out of which our ethical capacity is made. This view suggests there are inseparable ethical connections between humanity's relationality with other natural processes on the planet and humans' activities with each other. It's not an either or quandary. In this political space, we remain attentive to the fact that climate change is certain to increase certain forms of injustice already operating in our various sociological and cultural settings. Due to historical inequities and disparities in the social and institutional context of human activity, the reality of climate change, existing vulnerabilities related to social inequalities will be exasperated. Given these sovereign realities in this cataclysmic moment, a feminist vision I've tried to outline reminds us that as a distinctive aspect of myriad nature, humans have been shaped by evolutionary constraints to both understand and appreciate our constitutive relationality. Varieties of ways our humanity is expressed and configured as women, men, children, and other expressions of humanity, all of those are part of an interacting, evolving, and genetically related community of beings bound together in space and time. Thank you. Well, I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very clear presentation. Um, we have, you have made us think and we have many questions. We will try to pose them to you in in, in, in order, um, okay. perhaps um, the, the first question will be a, re a reaction to, to your first question about your definition of feminism. Okay, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Um, so when, when I was listening to you, um, it, 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 it's clear to me that you, your definition of feminism transcends these binary notions into a more dualistic way of understanding the relationship between these binaries through religious naturalism. And this resonates a lot with um, decolonial definitions of feminism and also um, with these decolonial feminists and in the indigenous feminist understanding of nature. Right. Um, one, one of the main, I will think, aspects of these decolonial views on, on nature from feminism is also um, advocating different ways of understanding the world, different ways of knowing, different ways of apprehending the world. Um, the, the question is, how would your definition of feminism and religious naturalism relate to other these worldviews and uh, these other ways of understanding the world? Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Mariana. 
Um, I don't, I, I, I actually think that um, the, the working definition that I have for feminism coming out of religious naturalism dovetails nicely with these others because I think most of the decolonizing uh, works that I've been looking at and reading about, they're all about how one aspect of life has tried to um, colonize another aspect of life. And in my narrative, uh, we're all part of the same, but we're not unilaterally the same. So there's biodiversity, but when one part tries to take over, it's colonizing. And so that's where I see it fitting in as well. The distinction I have, however, is that I'm suggesting that the human itself is not the point of departure at all. So it has resonance with a lot of ecofeminism, although I go a step further than ecofeminism. What I'm trying to suggest is that the more than human world constitutes our very notion of what it means to be human because we're embedded in these other processes that preceded us. And so we have to acknowledge that the very fact that we are byproducts of these other processes, they're part of us, we're part of them. And we need to start enacting that in responsible ways and start being colonizers, not only of each other, other humans, but myriad nature because that's part of us. And, and traditional, traditional ecofeminism still sees humans somewhat distinct from nature that you're trying to rescue. And I'm saying, no, you start with the more than human world and we're an integral part of it, but we're not, we're not the starting point at all. Yeah, and Carl, I have a question. And about is it's related with um, what you have called the enlightenment racism and that comes from the, um, the intersection between race and culture and how this has translated into me mechanisms of control and organization of the world by what you have called in other works and um, white supremacist principles these violences are in, embodied in, in millions of people uh, in the world, especially women who, who suffer persecution, abuse and murder in, on a daily basis. Right. So what, what are the possibilities of survival and subversion for these bodies, uh, which are under attack in, in very extreme conditions, such as Latin American uh, conditions, uh, including also uh, African American in the US, um, but also migrants, refugees, and victims of organized crime. Mm -hmm. um, what What's the question? I, I got yeah. the first. Part. What's the particular question? What is? Yeah. What are the possibilities of uh, survival and subversion of what you have called also uh, these grassroots movements, which articulate to to subvert? The, the, these okay. white supremacist principles right. and, and this right. world order. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so when I go back to uh, the hard idea of control of nature and the whole idea of white supremacy, the, the issue is the tentacles of white supremacy and it's built on this bifurcation. And until we can get the majority of human beings to not enact this type of bifurcation throughout various forms of violating the, 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 the innate harmony that we all have. Because that's what violence is, is violating the fabric, the seamless togetherness that we all have. So around subversion, um, I, I don't know how, I don't know, I don't know if feminists themselves can do it. We need, there needs to be some large scale revolution in our thinking about who we are. I think that's the subversive part. And we need to, the sciences are helping us, believe it or not. We know the humanities help, we know the arts do. And what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to use science in a subversive way to say that early forms of science were dangerous but if you now look at what's going on around systems thinking, 
you look at the idea of physics and all, they have it, that whole interconnectedness. So I think one way is to subvert, and this is why I'm using philosophers, feminist philosophers of science, because they're doing it. And we need to not, not focus on scientism, but on the holistic views of science that are coming forth. That's the intellectual. Around the activism, because remember my definition of feminism is not just intellectual discourse, it's also activism. Um, I think we just have to be subversive around legislation, around voting, continue marching. We can't let go of those. They're embodied ways in which we are proposing our agency. So we have to constantly affirm life, affirm life, and do it in subversive ways. And I love art. I also think that art is, you know, will help. Um, and everything becomes political if you talk about how life is the ultimate goal, the flourishing of life of which we are a part. So we need to, we need to be subversive about challenging the anti-life impulses that we see going on. And as you all know, well, as you know, the former president of the United States was one of the biggest perpetuators of horrific forms of bifurcation, arbitrary borders, you know, the wall. I mean, and and it's just, and he and he he might run again. I, and I guess for me as a US citizen, I, I'm I'm afraid of why how Americans are still buying into this type of dualism. And it just, I don't know, I guess I, I want to try to have hope around the fact that um, if more of us sort of recharge our thinking around some of the ideas, then maybe that can help. So I'm a little humble, but <laughs> even after all of that, I'm still a little humble by what I think might be possible, but I love the idea of subversion. Thank you. I think we share your feeling. Uh, Thank very you. Much. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and you've mentioned um, something which is, for me, it, it, I would like to highlight, you said a subversion in terms of the way you understand science. Right? Yeah. A subversion in terms of how we approach science. It seems to, to us, because we've talked about your work and then we've listened, Maria Jose and I have listened to you now, that you're also using a very particular way of understanding the religious. Yes. Um, which yes. is also yes. um, subversion, right? It is. Yes. Could you please yes. elaborate on that, especially for our students and yes. of course for us? Well, it's not theology. I'm not working, <laughs> it's not, I'm not working within a religious tradition. I'm outside of it because I don't think the traditional religions are helpful anymore. I mean, it's been eons and we're still doing the same thing. So I'm working outside of traditional religious categories um, and trying to suggest that um, religiosity is a way of understanding this connectedness, this interconnectedness, if you will. So yes, there's subversive stuff going on with that. If you know, I did not mention the God word at all, because the God word has no place here. It's not really relevant. So I'm subverting even those notions that there's something there that's going to save us. None of that. So it's very, very subversive on those many levels. Um, and it's a sovereign type of realism as to what is here. What can we know about? We know about what it means to be human because we studied humans enough that we can say there's possibilities. And the reason feminism is so important is because feminism has been one of the most sustained critiques of challenging the normative way of what it means to be human, which has been couched in masculinist terms and that separation. And this is why I keep bringing in the feminism here because it has enhanced our way of challenging all of the isms, if you will, and all of these bifurcations that still become perpetuated for those who are selfish, for those who are optimistic in their thinking. Um, so I hope that helps. But yes, definitely, um, it's, it's a new way of thinking about religion.
Um, and some people say, why is that religion? Well, religion is... <laughs> And that's actually my, my next, my, my reaction. I would like you to, um, because I think the, we really need this conversation yeah. um, uh, it, it, today right. about uh, what, what you're pointing out. I think it's crucial, especially when we think about feminism, about women being people, right. like some, some, some traditional religious views have systematically ignored right exactly um so i i can understand why you're drawn away from those conceptions of the religious and right um i i was just wondering just to 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 clarify um and especially because it's the first time we talk about these issues in our university be, before i let Ma maria jose ask you another question okay. is um how why use the word religious in, when, yeah. when you're talking about interrelations okay. i know it is relevant um and i share with you that relevance i would just would like you to elaborate a little a little more on that okay yeah so thank you again that's a very helpful question i'm a philosopher of religion and i theorize around the very uh, religious ideas i'm a philosopher so religion is values discourse this is that part when i was talking about values so religion is one Values are ideals, principles, notions that we have by which we um, govern our behavior. And traditionally, religion has operated in humans' lives to help them to answer the question, what ought you to do? So that's the ethical realm. Religion has also helped people to, to, to answer the question, what is real? What is real? And then how do you relate to it? As you know, I said, what is ought to be real is nature. And we're a part of it. So I this is quintessentially religious. Now, other religious religions might have different answers to what is ultimately real and how to relate to it, but I'm still asking the same religious questions given different answers. Does that make sense? And and so the first structure of religion is about values discourse, and humans raise those questions. Is there a God? Is there not? Those are questions of value and metaphysics and meaning and purpose, and they're existential questions. And I'm taking those, but I'm filling it in with different content. And that's the subversive part. But it, yeah, so, and with available knowledge from the sciences and the social sciences and the arts. It's a very eclectic, um, organic approach. And it's this world, this world is it. I mean, we're material, we, this is why I was saying, you, we, we can't, a lot of those traditional, the great by and by, and no, this is it. And this is why it's so important to affirm our embodied reality. And this is again, why feminism is so important because the fact that we were deemed closer to nature, well, nature is beautiful. Nature is spectacular. Let's claim it and do wonderful things with it. And we need to get more people thinking about that and not thinking we're separate. Yes, and I just want to say before I let Maria Jose speak that it, it, it does, it, it not only makes sense, it, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful way of, of putting it. So thank you, thank you. Um, Maria Jose, go ahead. Yeah, we'll have to have drinks and all. Somehow I, either you come here or I'll come there because you can't, this, you can't do this without having a nice drink and good meal, right? <laughs> that's, part, that's part of the important. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I know yeah, you have just said yeah, you, you're not working on, on theology. Uh, right, uh, right. Uh, even though I, I found some of your arguments uh, very similar to those of the Latin American theology uh, of liberation or liberation. Oh, yes, theology. absolutely. It, yeah, so absolutely. The, this, um, the material reality of the spiritual action that uh, is worked by, by these uh, liberation theologists uh, is, is very similar to, to what you have just said in, in one of the last um, pictures you placed on your presentation that says, justice can, cannot be realized in the abstract, but right. must be lived. So right. I, I, I read the, that phrase and it came to me that idea of the uh, liberation uh, in, in this uh, Latin American movement. So um, how the, uh, this uh, religious naturalism uh, 
can be uh, understood in other realities outside the, the US and, and the African American experience because this is uh, when I uh, met you, it's when I first um, heard about it. So what are the, the possibilities uh, for this uh, religious naturalism outside the US? Oh yeah, I, I, religious naturalism, we have members of our, this is a movement, it's becoming global. And, and let me also say, I studied Latin American liberation theology as an undergrad. And you're absolutely right. It has the neo-Marxist, you know, justice cannot be enacted in the abstract. Uh, it's about materiality. It's about emboldening in our understanding that material uh, reality is good and we need to honor that and all. And that there are forces that you have to fight against in the material world and all like that. So it dovetails nicely with Latin American liberation, the, all of the liberation theologies, whether it's African-American here, um, gay liberation, lesbian liberation, trans, all of those, all of those movements are about allowing life forms to flourish and be themselves. And that's where it dovetails. Now, my point of departure is a little different though because I don't have the God who's working with, in, in traditional liberation theologies, there's the God who worked with in history. I don't have that because I'm, I'm a naturalist. <laughs> so that's where it separates. But to me, the, the end goal is important. Who cares? I mean, ultimately, if people want to affirm God, so be it. It's what we are fighting against that's important <laughs> and what we're trying to achieve that's important. And there are many different inroads to how we're going to try to talk about that interconnectedness. Does that help? Yeah. And, and outside of the United States, I mean, this, this, as I said before, religious naturalism is just emerging. But there's, uh, if you go to RNA Religious Naturalist Association, we have a website. It is a movement. And it, we have people from around the world belonging to this movement because most people are saying, ah, this makes sense, of course, uh, especially around climate change. <laughs> and and uh, think about this. The reason I highlighted climate change is that climate change is about life itself and we are a part of life. So even some of these other things we're fighting for, if there's no life, so we have to tackle, we have to tackle. And we must also honor the, the good science that helps us to make sense of it. So it's not separating humanistic, artistic goals from scientific goals. They're all interrelated. Um, so listening to you, when you say I'm a naturalist and, and then, um, having this subverted notion of what is religious, then it comes also to, and, and thinking about the theology of liberation's argument that, that, um, that you have touched upon, I think religious has historically also to do with this transcendental notion that, there is, that life does not end in right. what we know as nature. Right? How would you approach this question? Or do you think it is a question that religious naturalism eventually should approach? Uh, well, let me, if, let me say, Mariana, that the, the, you're talking about eschatology, the idea of final destiny. Not all religious traditions hold that up. When you think of Taoism, when you think of, um, um, Confucianism, those are religious traditions in which uh, the, the natural world is also just, and there's nothing beyond it. So uh, the transcendental or eschatological views of religion are confined to some, but not all. So this is a religious worldview that stands outside of the norm. That's why I said it departs from some of the more traditional notions of um, religion. As to whether religious naturalism says this world is it, this life is it, this is it, this is it. Um, as long as nature is alive, life is alive. 
And I can't say anything beyond that. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Carl, and what about the, the political implications of your work? I, I mean, you, you have uh, talked about uh, activism and art and ethical implications and being uh, subverted with um, law and, and all of this. What, what could be some of the political implica implications of your work? I think that's up to anyone who wants to take it and take the metaphor of interconnectedness. I think that's at the heart of most, most political uh, activism, that you're, if you are the marginalized, you have not been allowed to flourish. You're not being allowed to actualize yourself. You're challenging the dominant ideology that keeps you from actualizing yourself. And so my work is basically saying that that's part of what this is about, that we act because we recognize that we are related to each other. And again, when one part tries to take over, that's colonization. And then you create the dominant, you create the inferior, and we, we don't have to do that. We don't have to do that. The fact that we've done it in the past doesn't mean we have to continue to perpetuate that. So the political is just part of the natural. And look at what's going on, look. It's just, it, in a way it's almost common sense, but I think that what's happening is that certain ways that people are enacting their humanities out of this atomistic, autonomous notion, it's all about me, me, me. It's greed, it's selfishness, it's the lack of understanding that what you do affects others. So it's all almost sort of counterintuitive, the greed and all, if people would, but a lot of it has to do with socialization and, and then the economic system, how that is set up. So it's all, Become, has become so complicated now. Um, so I, I, again, I think the, 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 the political is basically understanding the overall conceptual schema that I'm highlighting. And I think that's been expressed in many different ways by other people as well. It's not unique to me. It's just, I'm, I'm trying to say it in a particular way, but it's not unique. And be, before we finish, um, mm -hmm. there is a question from people watching about this notion of transcendence that you've just explained. And the question is, there is no notion of transcendent, but is there a notion of the sacred within religious naturalism? The sacred is life. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and what I mean by sacred, beauty. Sacred is something that is precious that so i'm trying to get away from sacred profane and that's another bifurcation so yes the sacred has to do with what we honor what we revere what we adore if we can't adore life and each other what can we do so yes in that way it talks about the sacred so it will call, probably be considered horizontal notion of the sacred versus the vertical and it's diffused, it's diffused. It's challenging any sort of bifurcation around our genetic interrelatedness, everything. There are times when we diminish ourselves and that's not good, but in and of itself is good, it's sacred. Thank you for that question, whoever asked it. <laughs> Uh, and, and thank you for sharing so generally your ideas with us. Um, yes. time, time is up. We hope yes. to continue this conversation with you with drinks in Monterrey soon. Absolutely. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thanks a lot. And um, thank you, Anna. I, I, I enjoyed this. Thank you so much. And you all be well and be safe. Thank you very much. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Y para quienes nos están viendo por internet, recordarles que las jornadas de feminismos terminan mañana y los invitamos a nuestros eventos. Pueden consultar nuestro programa en la página web de la Catedral Alfonso Reyes.
y también en el Facebook de la Cátedra Alfonso Reyes y en el Facebook de la Escuela de Humanidades. Muchas gracias. Y recordarles también que eh, estas discusiones nos llevan a esta idea que hemos estado trabajando a lo largo de las jornadas y es que la nueva realidad será feminista o no será. Gracias. <risa>